Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. Just got finished watching the State of the Union, parentheses, I didn't actually watch it, but I did read some of the transcript. And one of the things uh, Biden mentioned was that, you know, he still wants to push for paid family leave, for paid family medical leave, parental leave, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that was something that the Democrats were sort of trying to get done last year as part of the Build Back Better agenda. Um, but they weren't actually trying to get done uh, uh, anything that resembles what you might think of as a good parental leave program of the sort that you see elsewhere in the world. Um, and I recently wrote a piece about uh, state level uh, paid leave programs that we have in the U.S. And so I thought, hey, if Biden's talking about it, the advocates are talking about it, I just wrote a piece about it, let's hop into it, get it onto YouTube, because people on YouTube might be interested in the subject as well. So let's hop in to the piece I wrote earlier this week. So the piece is titled, All 12 State Parental Leave Programs Are Awful. And sub ahead here is, on average, work history requirements render one in three women ineligible for parental leave benefits. So if you don't already know, we have 12 states in the U.S. that have uh, parental leave programs. Uh, D.C. also has uh, such a program, though I did not analyze it for this piece. Um, and these, these uh, programs are all passed in, you know, quote unquote, blue states and uh, they're all kind of pushed by the same little bevy of organizations, uh, most prominently the National Partnership for Women and Families. It's all the same group of funders. I think these days uh, Melinda Gates is kind of the whale in that funding uh, a group. She's, she's pumping all the money into those groups. And, you know, the sad thing is that uh, parental leave is a great benefit, but the people who promote it uh, promote garbage, the stuff that they push out to all these states and push out to federal uh, legislators is just crap. It's it's not what you see in, in, a, in the best countries in the world, um, and it has a lot of very obvious flaws that are very easy to fix and that they just refuse to do anything about. So for this piece, what I uh, did was I looked at the work history requirements for claiming parental leave in the 12 states that have it. So uh, let's start with this table here because that will help you get a, a grasp of what work history requirements are. So we see here for each state the work history needed in the prior year in order to be eligible for benefits, right? So this is, you know, let's say you have a kid and then you go to the state agency and you say, hey, just had a kid. Where's my parental leave benefit? They're going to ask you, or rather, they're going to look into their own records, and if they're not in their own records, then you'll have to go chase down pay stubs and, you know, whatever. But they're going to say, look, the only way you can get benefits is if you've done this work history requirement, right? And then there are other rules as well. You may not get benefits if you are self-employed. You may not get benefits if you are employed by a small employer. Uh, some of them carve out municipal employees. There's, there's a lot of other carve-outs as well. But this is the big one, right? You have to have posted this kind of work history in the year prior to you trying to uh, uh, claim parental leave benefits. So you see here in California, you need, you need to have earned $300 in the prior year. In Colorado, that same number is $2,500. In Connecticut, it's $2,325 in the highest quarter of the prior year. Um, you have to, In Delaware, you need to have worked 1,250 hours in the prior year. And you can see on and on here. Um, the steepest requirement is Rhode Island, where you need to have worked 52 weeks, which is to say all of the weeks, at 30 hours per week, which is uh, damn near full time, uh, whether you want to call that 40 hours or 35 hours, um, and on it goes. If you don't meet these requirements, you don't get anything. No benefits for you. And so what I tried to do is I went into the American Community Survey, which we've talked about on some of my prior uh, uh, videos, and I just went through all the women in all of these states and I don't know why that cursor shows up. It's weird. Anyways, I went through all the uh, uh, women in all, this, all of these states, 
and I looked at their work history in the prior year because that's one of the things they ask you in the American Community Survey. They say, how many weeks did you work last year? What is the usual amount of hours you work in a given week? And they also ask you how much you, uh, income you receive from wages and salaries. So with those three variables um, and a gender variable, uh, or I guess a sex variable technically is, is how it's uh, set up in the survey, um, and then an age variable, we can cut women between the ages of 18 and 45. That's kind of the primary you know, years when people are having uh, kids, at least women. We can really zoom in and say, what percent of women who are 18 to 45 uh, met the work history requirement in their state in the last year, in 2021? And what we find is in the average state, 36% of women in this age range did not meet the work history requirements of their state's parental leave program. In Rhode Island, it got as high as 51%. So here's the graph. In California, 30% of women between the ages of 18 and 45 did not meet the work history requirement. Colorado was 25%, Connecticut 27%. It's actually higher in Connecticut, but they had a weird way of defining it as 2,325 in the highest quarter, you're unable to figure out how much someone earned in the highest quarter of the last year. So I just used earned any, this at all. So, you know, the actual number here is higher. It's, I don't know, probably closer to 35% or more uh, that failed that work history requirement. In Delaware, it's 42%. Like I said before, Rhode Island, it's 51%. Um, and I also, you can also break it down by age. Um, and we do this in this graph here. So at every single age between 18 and 45, I saw what percent of, I looked into what percent of women failed the work history requirement. And this is what I was expecting to find, which is that young women, like an overwhelming percentage of young women, especially women below the age of 25, fail this work history requirement. And if you know anything about labor market patterns, uh, this is not uh, hard to, uh, the, 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 it was obvious that this is what was going to come out of the graph because some of these people are still in education, even the ones who aren't in education. Young workers have the weakest attachment to the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for young women in particular, uh, these work history requirements are just killing them. If you get pregnant at 20, you know, like the average uh, person at 20, if they were to get pregnant, they would not be eligible for benefits in any of these states. Um, as I say here, some women are rendered ineligible because they did not work at all in the prior year, either because they were in school, disabled, unemployed, or caregiving. But many other ineligible women did actually work, just not enough to meet their state's work history requirements. And in that case, these women actually contribute part of their paycheck into the state's parental leave program, but then are denied benefits when they have children. So think about that. If you're out there working, but you don't, you know, you don't manage to put in 52 weeks at 30 hours per week, maybe you work part time, or maybe you were unemployed at some point in the prior year, whatever, you pay in, you're paying in your 0.5% or 0.8%, whatever the tax is in your area that covers this benefit, you pay in, pay that in. And then you go to the state agency and say, good, good to go. Parental leave, where's my money? And they're like, nope, sorry, you don't get anything. So they, they're moving, they're trucking money away from even these people who work and, 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 it's all, and, and then only giving the benefit out to people who work a ton. Um, and as I note here, you know, the women who are screened out of eligibility tend to have less education and receive lower pay. So put differently, it's the lower class that is disproportionately put, pushed out of these programs. Right, so the lower class women in these groups, they're the ones that are getting you know, disproportionately uh, pushed out of the programs. And the other weird thing about this, and I don't mention this in this piece, but the paid leave stuff is really strange because the idea behind, so we have other benefits that require you to have a certain work history. Social security is the most obvious example of this, but social security is primarily a benefit for old age. Right. And so there's a kind of convenience to the fact that you only become old and elderly and retired after you have worked. 
right? And so it's possible to go look at your whole work history and say, hey, I need you to have worked at least 10 years. That's effectively the main work history requirement for Social Security old age benefits. You need to have worked 10 years. And, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. I wouldn't design it that way. But, you know, at least there's some symmetry between the fact that this happens after you've worked. This is a benefit you only get after you've worked. So it's possible to kind of see, did you pay in? Did you work enough in your life to have earned Social Security and blah, 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 right? I might do a whole other video on that. But it's possible there because you claim that benefit in old age. But uh, parental leave is something you claim in young age. It's a, it's a it's a you know most people have kids. The average age of first birth is in the twenties, right? So most of the amount that you're ever going to pay in to the parental leave program is going to occur after you've already had your kids, because most of your career, most of your working life occurs after you've already had your kids. And so there's this weird situation where if you decide, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have my kid at 22, you're very likely to not be eligible for these benefits, right? But then, so you have the kids, you don't get any benefit from the program because you failed the work history requirement. Then you go out and for the rest of your life, you contribute into the program. You now spend another 30, 40 years of your life working contributing money into a program that you are not eligible for, that they declined you from when you went to try to get it. That's how all these uh, programs work in every single one of these states. The other interesting thing to note here is when you look at this graph here, you know, it's younger women who get screened out. So there's an interesting question, which is who has kids here? right? The, in, the, in the groups that are getting screened out. And who has kids over here? I mean, there's a lot of people getting screened out across the board, but there's a, the most are here, right? This is really the problem area. So, you know, I, I, I wanted to see, I wonder who it is that has kids over here, you know, because we know who writes these bills. We know who staffs the National Partnership for Women and Families. It's a certain kind of most likely woman, <laughs> uh, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a woman organization. Um, they have a college degree. They work an office job. They have a certain understanding of how work uh, works and a certain understanding of when you have kids. Um, but that understanding is very class biased. So I went into the current population's surveys fertility supplement. They put that out every couple of years. Um, and I looked at uh, when people have birth based on their education. So basically, in the 2018 file, I just isolated all the women who are between the ages of 40 and 45. Those are often ages that are used to analyze completed fertility because it's very few people have any kids beyond this age. It's, it's almost like biologically impossible for the most part. Occasionally it happens. Um, so, you know, if we look at this group, we can then kind of look back and say, hey, when did you have your kids? And that's what the CPS fertility supplement does. And what we can see is what percent of women had already had a kid, at least one kid, at each age, right? And so if we look at... For instance, the red line here, and we look at age 25, what we see is uh, women who at age 40 to 45, when they ask them, what, was your, what education did you attain? They say, I only got a high school degree. So people who only had a high school degree at age 40 to 45, those people, 60% of them had had a child by the age of 25. And for less than high school, it was up, up of, you know, around 68% already had a child by age 25. But we go down here to the college educated, it's less than 25% who has a kid by the age of 25. And in general, you can kind of see the, you know, the paths of these lines. The highly educated women have kids much later in life than the less educated women have kids. And so, you know, as I say here, if your family model, if your model for family formation is to get a four-year degree, become firmly rooted in a career, and have kids in your 30s, which is, by the way, the uh, family formation model of uh, the people who staff these organizations, who promote these bills. <laughs> um, then the work history requirements that we talked about above, no problem. You'll satisfy them, no problem. But if you're not one of those people, if you're one of these uh, lesser educated people who tend to have kids younger in life, you, you get screwed. You get screwed out of benefits.
So it's really a quite a perverse situation. Um, and what's so galling about it is it's not hard to fix this problem, right? As I say here, it would be fairly easy as a policy matter to ensure that all parents are eligible for a decent parental leave benefit. All you have to do is create a minimum benefit, for example, one set equal to the minimum wage, and declare that all new parents are eligible for at least that benefit, right? So you, you could get higher than that based on the earnings replacement formula that's used to uh, do the parental leave benefit. You could get higher than that. But you could set a floor that says no one gets below this. I don't care what your work history is. I don't care if you've ever worked at all. I don't care what your earnings history is. I don't care about any of that. Everyone who has a kid at least will get 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever it is at the minimum wage. You put that in your program and you're good to go, right? Now, your program might have other problems, but you would at least solve this problem. You could at least now claim you have universal paid leave. That's the other one of the galling things about these uh, advocates is they, they call these programs universal paid leave. They're not. They're absolutely not. What is universal about this? Is this universal? No. Anyways, I wrote a piece uh, actually during uh, the federal debate because on the, the, the proposal that was being pushed through the federal level, oh my God, it was, it was, it was trash in so many ways. It wasn't even a, it wasn't even a public paid leave program. It was really a subsidy program for employers to purchase a private paid leave insurance. It was disgusting, just the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. I can't imagine how anyone in this in these organizations woke up each day and hit the hit the streets for uh, federal subsidies for private uh, employer provided paid leave insurance. Like they've not learned anything at all about our dysfunctional employer provided health insurance system. But whatever, that's not the 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 point of this video. In that federal proposal, they had the same stuff that was going on here. They had their own work history requirements, and those work history requirements changed as the legislation was being drafted. At first, you had to work a certain amount in the last like nine months before birth, and then it was three to six months, and then there was also an earning, a minimum earnings requirement where you had to earn over a certain amount in the prior two years. So they, they did all this, you know, it was all versions of this shit, and we see what that gives us, right? Um, and when I kind of started critiquing that, one thing I heard from people is they were saying, well, Matt, you know, it's, it's, it's paid leave from work. So of course you have to be working to get it, right? And the answer to that is no, absolutely not. Look at any other country, not any other country, but most of the countries, especially in Northern and Western Europe that provide this benefit, make it so that you can get the benefit whether you were working immediately prior to giving birth or not. They do that through that minimum benefit uh, approach that I just discussed. And so I wrote this piece that explained why it, was, it would be wise to actually make it a universal benefit that anyone could get uh, and not peg it to these work history rules that exclude like a third of new parents. Um, so argument one, other countries do it. You know, that's always very compelling to me, though it seems to be compelling to almost nobody else. I use some examples, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Germany. We could go on and on. It also follows from the parental leave policy rationale. So there's two ways to think about parental leave benefits. The first way is to think about it as a child care benefit similar to, the, to home child care allowance benefits that some countries pay to parents who choose to care for their own young kids rather than use child, child care services. So if you think about it as a child care benefit, well, clearly all parents who have kids and are taking care of them should get the child care benefit, not just those who happen to have been working five months ago and earned $2,500 in the highest quarter. They're all providing the child care. So they should all get a benefit, right? So if you think about it as a child care benefit, that, that's very clear. Now, the other way to think about it is to say it's not a child care benefit per se. It's a benefit for someone who currently is facing a work limitation, sort of like unemployment and disability benefits, right? So it's a benefit for kind of the parent, not for the child, as a child care benefit is, but for the parent 
who is facing a work limitation. The problem with this is this rationale also says you should include all parents, even a parent that was not previously working, because the presence of a newborn that they must care for prevents them from working right now. In the moment, they cannot work, regardless of whether they worked previously, so they face a work limitation. So they should be included in the scheme. Simple as that. Another thing, it's a better failure outcome. This is something that is just basically doesn't exist in any U.S. welfare discourse. But the welfare state, I like to think about it as magic, but at the end of the day, it's not really magic. There are real people that have to administer real benefits. There are paperwork problems. There's information problems. There's data sharing problems. There are form problems. There are administrative problems. There's all these problems that come into administering a benefit, and especially a benefit like this where you're basing it on their prior income, and you need to base it on their prior income. Otherwise, people, you know, if you want to allow someone who makes sort of $80,000 a year to take leave, you need to base the benefit based on that $80,000. They need to be getting a higher benefit than someone that was making $30,000 in order to be able to kind of afford and smooth over their income when they take leave. So you need to base it on people's prior prior income and prior work to some extent. But if, if you base it if you exclusively base it on that and you say if you don't have a certain work history, you're not going to get anything at all, not only are you going to screen out all these people who don't have a certain work history, you're also going to end up screening out people who do have the relevant work history but just cannot demonstrate it to the welfare office, right? Because they might work in an informal job where these things are not reported. There are all sorts of industries that kind of work like that. I uh, won't get into them here. They might, uh, you know, they might be working under the table in certain respects. Um, their employer might have just collapsed and gone bankrupt, and now they have no one to go get like a pay stub from to prove that they were. There's lots of reasons why there might be snafus that results in nothing, in, in you not being able to prove your work history or your earnings history. And when that happens, if you base eligibility on that, those people will get nothing. If instead you say, look, we're going to have a minimum benefit that at least everyone gets, those people will at least get the minimum benefit, right? So that's a better failure outcome. And failures occur, and your welfare state should, you should go into the welfare state clear-eyed, understanding that there are going to be administrative mistakes and administrative failures, whether it's private benefits, public benefits, there are going to be those. And so you should have a failure outcome in mind. And the minimum benefit that, that, that therefore exp you know, makes it universal is, is, a, is a good, the best way to handle, handle failure for this kind of benefit. And on and on, I point out that we actually do do this kind of thing for other benefits in the U.S. Now, I keep telling you that other countries do this kind of stuff, and they do. Uh, and I got kind of curious, actually, a couple weeks ago. I've spent a lot of time reading the sort of descriptions of welfare programs in other countries, like way too much time, like a lot of my life actually doing this. Um, and for what? Who knows? To make this YouTube video, I guess. But as part of that, I'm kind of, you know, there's always an interesting question of who's the best? What's the best country at a particular benefit? And, you know, it's not always easy to make that call because benefits have different parameters. So like paid leave, there's a question both of how many days of paid leave you get, but also what income replacement you get, but also what is the minimum benefit, if there is a minimum benefit. In most cases, there is. Um, you know, there's lots of different variables that go into it. But with that said... I think of all the countries I've ever looked at, believe it or not, Slovenia of Slavo Žižek fame appears to have the most extreme, I won't say extreme, the, the greatest, the best parental leave benefits, um, and, and including some features that you just do not see in other countries. And it's, it's very unusual in many respects. So let's let's talk about the Slovenia parental leave uh, program. So in Slovenia, they have essentially three buckets of leave. You have maternity leave, which is the leave for the mother. You have paternity leave, which is the leave for the father. And then you have parental leave, which is leave that they both get. And that's uh, a kind of a joint bucket sort of 
Um, and you see this in a lot of countries, actually. You know, ba- back in the day when, uh, when these countries first got parental leave, oftentimes you'd only have maternity leave. That's what it's actually just called a maternity leave benefit. Over time, they would add a paternity leave benefit, and then they would add a parental leave benefit that was more ag- agnostic to mother or father. And so they kind of accumulated this, you know, three-part system which is not my ideal. I would I would say basically for me just have what they call parental leave and you know so you give a bucket of leave to each parent and then you can allow them to swap weeks back and forth if you want um but you don't really need this three part scheme but that's how they do it and it's not a big deal to do it this way. It's just it's not necessary and and you know I think if if you're starting one from scratch which we are basically in the US just skip maternity and paternity and just go full just go all parental leave um but whatever what's interesting about this uh first and foremost is um the well let's talk about the length of the leave so the maternity leave is 105 calendar days and usually this means 105 work days Though, I don't know, I didn't go deep in it, but normally the way these things are reported is this is 105 work days. So, you know, you don't count the weekend because you don't, you don't work on the weekend anyway. So this is actually like 21 weeks because 21 times 5 is 105. Um, they actually make uh, mothers take at least 15 days off. <laughs> you know, it's an Eastern European country. You know, it's, it's Eastern European. Um the father is only entitled to 30 calendar days, um, so 105 for the mother, 30 for the father. Again, like I said, for me, I would just go straight parental leave not and just put these days in this bucket, but, you know, that's not how they do it. Nonetheless, we got the parental leave bucket here, and for the parental leave bucket, um, each parent is entitled to 130 days each, which is 26 weeks, half a year. Another reason to suspect that this means, five, you know, work days, not all days. So another 26 weeks for each parent. So on top of the 21 weeks, the mother also gets 26 weeks. And then on top of the six weeks that the father gets, uh, he gets another 26 weeks. From there, you can transfer your weeks to the other uh, person. So... Um, the mother can transfer as much as 100 days to the father, which is 20 weeks, and the father can transfer all 130 days to the mother, which is 26 weeks. Again, you see, this is an Eastern European country. It's going to have, uh, typically, they have slightly more conservative sort of gender uh, ideas. So, you know, that's why the mothers get more than the fathers. That's why the mothers have to take time off where those fathers don't necessarily have to. That's why the, the, the father can transfer more leave to the mother than the mother can transfer to the father. Like I said already, to me, I would gender neutralize all of that. I'd give them each, you know, 150 days or 60 days or whatever it would be to put all this in one bucket. I'd give them each an equal amount, and then I'd say they could each transfer you know, whatever, 80% of the leave to the other person if they want to do that. But put that aside, that's not a huge deal. Who cares exactly how that's set up? What's interesting is, you know, the duration is quite substantial, right? A lot, a lot of leave uh, on the table here. There are countries, I think, that have ultimately more total leave. I think Sweden is probably, the, the at the moment, the leader and the total amount of days you could squeeze out of the leave program. Um, but this is really is, is right up there. What's remarkable about it, it you know, is not just the, um, is not just the amount of time that you can take off. It's also the amount of benefit you get. So this is, uh, what do we have here? Um, do they show it in this one? Do, 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 do. Surely it's in here, right? Do, do, do.
All right. Well, I, I, I read it on another website. I thought this was a better rundown of it, but I guess it lacks it. Anyways, the amount of benefit you get here is 100% of your wage, 100% income replacement. There are a handful of countries that have this, right? But not very many. 100%. You make $50,000 a year, you get $50,000 in income replacement, right? You know, divided by the weeks or whatever. You make a million a year, you get a million a year, at least for women. So for the maternity leave, for the maternity leave, there is no cap on how much income you could earn. So one way you could do this is you could say, look, we're going to replace 100% of your income up to $100,000 a year, right? And then, you know, you divide that by the weeks and whatever. That would be one way to do it, right? So 100% income replacement with a cap, a hard cap. After that, we're not doing anything, right? There is no cap for the maternity leave. If you're a woman who makes a million dollars a year, you would take that million dollars, we divide it by 52 uh, weeks, and that's how much you would get each week while you were on leave. For the fathers, there is a cap, but the cap is set to two and a half times the average wage of the country, right? So if the average wage is $50,000, two and a half times that would be $125,000. So you would get 100% income replacement up to two and a half times the national average wage, after which point, you know, that would be, you'd be capped out. And then for parental leave, it's the same thing. There's a cap at two and a, two and a half times the national average wage. No cap here though. No cap. And I've, I don't think I've ever seen another country that has no cap. Like theoretically, there's a woman in Slovenia who makes $2 million a year, goes on leave and gets, you know, whatever that would be. What's that? Hundred thousand is that right? Fifty thousand dollars a week. I don't know the math is. I'm struggling right now. <laughs> it would be a lot. Um, and so on top of that, on top of a hundred percent income replacement with no cap for mothers and a high cap for uh, the parental leave and the father's leave, um, they also have a great minimum uh, benefit here, uh, which is uh, euro four hundred and two dollars and 18 cents. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we should have a minimum benefit in our program. If you don't meet the work history requirements, you don't have any wages in your past year, um, they don't say, well, too bad you don't get anything because, you know, we're only paying 100% of your, of your prior wage. No. If your prior wage, which could be zero, if we take 100% of it and you're not getting this benefit, Right. If 100% of your prior wage is less than $402.18, including it might be zero dollars because you don't have any prior wage, um, we're gonna minute, we're gonna you know put in a floor here at $402 for you. I think this is for month uh, monthly amount. Now I don't know what is the sufficiency of this um, in Slovenia. You know Slovenia is a uh, you know, is, is, is not, is not as rich as, as other countries. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's the structure, right? So a decent minimum benefit, 100% income replacement <laughs> up to a high cap for fathers and no cap at all for mothers. A lot of weeks for both, both people. And you can swap those weeks across for flexibility purposes. Uh, I think this is number one. I think Slovenia probably is number one. Um, if you've got a better uh, uh, suggestion, you got a you got a better competitor in this space. Uh, obviously, drop it in the comments. But I think Slovenia is number one. Anyways, this is what we need to be doing with these state leave programs. Like the idea that Democrat, you know, I, I what I've learned in all this is that Democrats just don't care. They really just don't care about this, right? I mean, some of them are clueless and they're just kind of being led along by by NGO people who are don't care. Um, but like, they just don't care, right? It's like, they just want to kind of like check a box that says we did universal paid leave. And it doesn't matter whether you actually did universal paid leave. It doesn't matter if the program works. It does no one gives a shit. They just don't care enough to fix it. And one of the reasons I know this is because I will talk to these people, right? I've talked to people at NPWF and I said, what's, what's going on with this? Like, don't you see this problem here? Cause there are other problems in this as well. They're like, yeah, you know, I mean, you make some good points and we are aware of some of these problems, but, you know, it's just, 
we just we can't they just act like they can't do anything it's like well, who's leading this who is in control of this you are in control of this so do it someone needs to get off their ass and fix fix the benefit at least stop going to other states pitching them the same shit or if you are going to do that let let them at least know what you're giving them which is garbage make sure they know it's garbage if that's what you're going to pitch them Instead, they sneak this through. No one even covers this. I don't th- I've don't. i never seen anyone talk about this in any major publication. Even the people whose whole shtick is that they follow these kinds of benefits and they're real in They don't cover this shit. Um, you know, it's like no, one, no one's at the wheel. No one's watching this. No one cares. And they just keep spreading just the most garbage welfare state you could ever construct. Um, and it's remarkable to me. It's very, very surprising. I mean, I guess it's not surprising, but it's it's just amazing. Like, I just can't, and maybe this, I, I can't imagine getting up each day and wanting, like, if you're going to do this shit, why are you even involved in this kind of advocacy? Just go home. Go do something else. There's so many other things you could do in the world. And instead, you spend your life doing this? You spend your life doing this when you've got you could you could just copy Slovenia or in my uh, paper I wrote a long time ago the family fun pack I just basically copied Finland's approach which is not even as good as Slovenia's approach you could do all that that's all available it's very easy you just read it right here on the website and they just don't do it they refuse to do it and you know people suffer people really suffer and it's one of those things where I'm not saying voters are rational and all that kind of stuff. I don't think they really are necessarily. But if they were rational, the idea of the self-image of certain Democrats is, man, if voters were really rational, they would really vote for us all the time because we really, we really do them solid. We really care about them. And it's like, do you? Do you? I mean, how many of them, how many voters have tried to sign up for this program when they had a kid and... And they heard all about it. It was all in the news. We have a universal parental leave program. They go to sign up, and they're like, not for you. Well, how does that make them feel? What, what does that do for, you know, establishing yourself as a reliable provider, you know, that, that people should vote for? Not much, I wouldn't say. Anyways, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, share with your friends, um, and I'll, I'll be back with a with an, a few videos soon. I got a whole list of videos actually that I want to make. It's just you know finding the time to do it. So, see you later.